Uh, the feature that I think you're talking about was actually discovered in an image taken by Opportunity very early in its mission um, with a microscopic imager right, and it was right down at the limit of resolution of that camera. If you look down at the resolution, right down at the limit of resolution of our cameras, and it doesn't matter whether it's pan cam, nav cam, has cam, microscopic imager, take your pick. You go right down to the resolution limit, and you can see all sorts of very, very strange things. Um, I've seen iguanas in our pictures. <laughs> I've seen all kinds of stuff. That was, you can't tell. There's just no way to tell at that resolution. It was probably just an interesting set of lumps in the rock. Nothing more. Uh, we'll, we'll do our best to repeat the questions, yeah. Go ahead, George. Sir, sir. Uh, the film didn't uh, tell me how the, the spacecraft managed to land on its feet. Ah, how does the spacecraft manage to land right side up? Um, if you notice, the shape of the lander is tetrahedral. It's a three-sided pyramid, okay? So it can land on any one of four sides. If it lands right side up on what we call the base pedal, then those pedal open up, pe pedals open up and there's the rover right inside. But it can land on any one of those four sides. And if it lands on one of its sides, the motors that open the pedals up have enough torque that, they, that the, right, the vehicle sets, sets itself upright. So it's a self-riding vehicle. You can land on any one of the sides. Uh, Spirit landed on its base pedal, opened up just fine. Opportunity landed on one of the side pedals and flipped itself upright. Lady, we're in here. Blue shirt. Stuck in the sand? Uh, yeah, Spirit is stuck in some, it's not sand. If it were sand, we would have gotten out by now. Um, Spirit is stuck in some very, very strange soil. Um, this has happened to us a few times with this vehicle. At the place where Spirit has been exploring for the last couple of years, there are these treacherous invisible rover traps <laughs> beneath the surface. There is a soil there, and it's related to the silica discovery that I mentioned to you. There's a soil there that is made of a mixture of silica and iron sulfate salts. Very, very interesting scientifically. We think it may result from volcanic fumaroles where very hot steam, very caustic steam has come out of the ground and, and changed the, the nature of the soil there. But one of the characteristics of this soil is that it's very, very low in cohesion. It doesn't stick together well. And when you spin the wheels in it, they just kind of spin and spin and spin. Now, if this stuff were right at the surface, wouldn't be a problem. We'd see it coming. It's bright white. But the problem is it comes almost all the way to the surface, and then there's this veneer of regular-looking Martian dirt on top of it. So it's camouflaged. You can't tell until you've gotten into it. So you get into this stuff, and the wheels start to spin. Now, if we had a six-wheeled rover, i.e. if all six wheels were working properly, I think we could just power our way out of this. But right now, Spirit is effectively a five-wheel rover. We have five good wheels. The right front wheel doesn't turn. It hasn't turned since like day 800 of the mission. And so we're dragging this dead wheel as we drive. And that makes it very difficult to get out of this stuff. We have wandered into this stuff three times now. We've gotten out of it twice. This is the third. This is the worst of the three circumstances. I do not know if we'll get out or not. But we think we're just about ready to start. We think we got a plan, and we're going to give it a try and see what happens. Yeah, we saw about the water. Uh, we saw that the water was actually red because it was the iron out of the rocks because it, it was acid. But did you have any uh, evidence of water as it is here on Earth and any evidence of flowing water? OK. Uh, the, the question had to do was with, was the water like the water on Earth. First of all, there are places on Earth that you can go where you get very deep red water. If you go to the Rio Tinto in Spain, where the water is very acidic, it has that deep red color. And by the way, the deep red color is pure speculation on the part of the PI. I don't know if it was like that or not. Um, we do, what we do know is that the, the water at the Opportunity site was an acid brine. It was very acidic. It was very salty. Um, you have salty water all over the Earth. The oceans are salty. Different kind of salt. On Earth, it's chlorides. Here, it's, uh, on Mars, it's sulfates. Um, it, much more acidic than most of the waters on Earth. There are probably places on Mars where it was less acidic. Did the water come to the surface and flow across the surface? Definitely yes, because as the film mentioned, there are those little ripples that we see in places. How about right here in the red shirt? 
Sure. The question is about the MSL rover, how it's different, uh, how it's better than uh, Spirit and Opportunity. It is a much larger vehicle, so it will be able to go over larger obstacles and probably cover substantially greater distances. Um, it has a nuclear power source instead of solar cells, so you don't have to mess around waiting for wind gusts to give you the power that you need. Uh, most excitingly to me, as a scientist, it has the capability to drill into rocks, depths of you know, 8 or 10 centimeters, and extract powder from those rocks and then put them into a very sophisticated suite of instruments that includes the capability for the first time to look for organic molecules inside the rocks on Mars. And organic molecules, of course, are the building blocks of life. So it really takes it really take the story of early Mars much, much farther than we were able to do as very an opportunity. Scheduled for launch in 2011. On the extreme right. Yes. The light on Mars itself. The, the best that I can tell you is this movie was very carefully vetted by Lockheed, by NASA, by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And by my science team. <laughs> and we were approved all the way through. But obviously, we had to take some liberties in making a film. There is no sound in space, for instance. <laughs> the rover is moving the equivalent of 100 miles an hour on Mars. But um, everything beyond what we needed poetic license to make in the film has been very carefully vetted. I'd like to say w one other thing right now. Pumping Orion may sound like a silly movie back from the 70s, but it had an enormous influence. 100,000 gyms opened up around the world after that film came out. And I like to put my tongue in my cheek and say that it caused more cash flow than Star Wars. <laughs> but I, and it did in that case, because Arnold became a billionaire. The Wiener Brothers became billionaires, and bodybuilding became a 70 or 80 billion dollar a year business. The, the point I'm trying to make here is that I believe I'm standing in front of an advocacy society that would like much more action on Mars. And one way of doing this is to get films like this screened in audiences all over the world. And you would be very pleasantly surprised what a film like this can do. I am working on the Morris Science Lab film. We've, we're going to do it in 35 millimeter, not IMAX. It'll be two hours long. And it's going to dive into the mission and go through with great detail. And I, it's going to hit a completely different audience from this film. And these are things that can really change people's minds. One other example is that we've literally made Shackleton famous around the world with our Shackleton films. In 1999, when I started that project, very few people would have known about Shackleton. And these movies are powerful. And if you combine a movie with casting like Steve Squires, you get a very powerful <laughs> message out there. Next question. In the very back. Uh, Sir. I have a question. Uh, 